the next conversation is actually one I've been looking forward to for about half a year. And the reason is not, not just that um, uh, one of the first people that I interviewed for the book I wrote on Google uh, uh, called The Search was Susan Wisjecki, in whose garage Google was founded. Um, uh, but I uh, also spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand the way that they do sales. Um, and Google uh, is sort of run in two very large groups. There's product, product management, engineering, and then there's sales. Um, and the two, of course, meet and talk a lot. But uh, I had never seen the, the leads of those two groups in the same place at the same time. Um, uh, and uh, today we get that. Uh, we have Dennis Woodside, the head of US sales for Google, um, and Susan Wiszczecki, who runs uh, product and product management um, for uh, all the advertising platforms, among other things. Um, so that's kind of a unique opportunity for us to see both sides uh, of Google together in one place at one time. So please join me in welcoming Dennis and Susan. As, as Googlers go, you guys are, are, are long-termers. Uh, you're kind of a lifer, Susan. Um, since 1998, nine? 1999. 1999, which is, you know, pretty astonishing. And 2003, is that correct? That's right. That's right. right. Um, so tell me a little bit about what's changed since then. Like, when you joined Google in 99, there was no business model. Uh, there was no AdWords. There was no AdSense. Uh, there, you were sort of, you know. It was in your garage, wasn't it? At the time? You didn't join when it was in the garage, did no. you? You sort of thought there's a crazy people in my garage, and I'm going to sort of stay away from them for a little while. So I was just the landlord at that point. <laughs> right. Um, right. It did take me a little bit of time to realize, you know, because when you have um, two 25-year-olds working in your garage, saying that they're going to compete with companies worth billions of dollars, it's hard to know what to make of that. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to realize that they were really onto something. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you remember about any particular habits that Larry and Sergey had in that garage or anything that, <laughs> you know, I mean, just give us, tell us a story. Um, well, I, you know, one thing is, is it actually wasn't a garage. It, they entered through the garage. And it wasn't that big a house, but they entered through the garage and they had a couple you of bedrooms. You didn't want them going through your front door. No, so we had rules about whether they could enter through the front door or not. And they had a little doorbell on the front door, but I actually had them and all their guests enter through the garage door. Right. Um, but they, you know, they actually had access to the washer and dryer and to a bunch of other things that at the time were really seen as essential items. And a lot of, I think, Google's culture about ha you know, really being able to do everything at Google because we're 24 by 7, operation, a lot of that, I think they realize some of the value by operating out of a house. So, you know, always being able to have access to meals and washing a dryer and, you know, all the different services did you, that you need. Did you, so you opened your kitchen to them? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sensitive point. That was a sensitive point. <laughs> but they had a refrigerator. Ah, what was in it? <laughs> I don't know. I probably didn't want to know. <laughs> okay. So now, Dennis, you, you joined in 2003, and by then, Google was starting to become, this yeah. was a, a year before the IPO. Right. Um, and Google was sort of in its you know, pre-IPO frenzy. The press had fallen deeply in love with the company, and so it had almost everyone else, the brand that had sort of lit up in everyone's mind because you went to Google. And that was back in the day when it really was sort of magic to put in a couple of words, and all of a sudden, you found something on the web that, you know, delighted you, and I think the brand had that uh, power and still does. Um, why did you join, and, 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 and what was it like in 2003? Uh, so when I joined, there were about 1,000 people at Google. So it was on its way, uh, clearly. Um, there was still, I would say, an edge, and there still is, of, of chaos in how things got done. A lot of uh, people with their hair on fire running around. Yeah, I mean, so you'd show up. My first office was a closet shared with another person. But not typical. in Susan's house. Not in Susan's house. No, but there were rules in that closet. And, uh, uh, but I think, I think since then, you know, the company has become much more global. And even, even in 2003, uh, the majority of traffic to Google.com was coming from outside the U.S. 
Uh, I think what we've been able to do since then is really build up uh, a true global presence, not just uh, in terms of consumer usage, but in terms of a commercial presence. And uh, so I wound up spending most of my career at Google so far uh, until last year outside of the US um, in Europe. Right. So I think that was, that's been a big change for the company to become a truly global brand and uh, to be able to execute on a global scale. Now, how do, so you, you were outside the United States running and opening offices and running, uh, you know, ad sales operations. Yeah, so correct? I started up our uh, operations in places like Russia and Turkey and Central Europe when most people in the U.S. at least didn't really think there was much of a web market there or much of an internet uh, business to be made there. Right. And then I wound up uh, running our sales teams in uh, the U.K., Benelux, and Ireland. Right, right. Now, now, Susan, your your responsibility in your organization is you make the products, and you continue to iterate and tune the products yes. that Dennis then goes to market with. Is yeah. that about about right? Yeah. So right now, I have responsibility for the design and for the roadmaps for all of the advertising products. So that includes AdWords, AdSense, DoubleClick, Analytics, like really anything that has to do with advertising is um, my team is working on the design. and that and includes plans. now AdMob. Yes, AdMob too, Right. since it's mobile advertising. Right, right, right. And then, Dennis, you go to market with those, with those That's products. That's right. Without Susan, I have no job. And without Dennis, <laughs> I have no job. So we're a team. These guys, you like each other. You really like each other. <laughs> um, and so one of the questions I have for you, Dennis, and, and this is you know, one of those questions that, that you know, may seem sort of circular, but most of the advertising on Google up until very recently was not really sold. It was bought. And, and by that I mean, you know, it was an, a self-service mm -hmm. online platform and, and, and marketers went and there was a whole ecosystem that developed around that platform with SEO, SEM firms who mastered the art of trying to get great placement on Google, right? And you may have worked as an agency or a marketer with those folks, but working directly with Google, it's almost like you're not so much selling something as helping people figure out how to use the systems you've got. Is that still true, or how has that changed in a certain way? So I would say there's still a big element of that. If you think about Google, uh, of our advertisers, the vast majority are small and medium enterprises by number, and not necessarily by revenue. Uh, and most of those are managed through our self-service platform and through small SEMs or agencies um, throughout the world. Uh, that said, there still are a large number of advertisers that are investing millions of dollars a quarter with Google. And when you're talking to a large retailer or uh, a large consumer products company, they're making budgeting decisions like anybody else. Do I put money into TV or do I put money into search? Uh, and if search, do I put money into Google? So that's a, I would say, more typical sales uh, approach. And a lot of what we try to do is help them understand what the consumer is doing in uh, online and how search can help them achieve their, their marketing objectives. Got it. Um, how do your two teams work together? In other words, you're out in the market. How large is the sales organization in the United States? Uh, roughly 2,400 people in the Americas, North and South in the, America. In the Americas, yeah. 2,400. So not, not small. No. It's a significant number. Yes. Um, so they're out getting feedback from the market. And the market's telling them, I wish you were doing this, or this is a nice product, but um, how do you take that feedback and give it to Susan and say, can we tweak this a little bit? You know, is there, well, give, give us the sense of how the two teams work together in that. So hopefully we have the same answer about that. <laughs> um, but I think it happens on a number of different levels. So first of all, we have on the sales team, we have a number of, of product specialists. And the product specialists are the ones in sales who, who gather all of this feedback from the sales teams. And then they work with my team on each of the individual products. And you know, we go over our roadmaps with them. We describe the prioritization. We explain why we can or can't do something. Then there's another process where product actually says, you know, we are super excited about these things. So we just built this product. It's new. It's different. We really want you guys to sell it. And so one of the things we started to do is we started to say, this is the priority for this quarter. We're going to choose a couple of things that we're going to get everyone in sales to adopt. Can you give us adopt. an example of a, of a new product that you recently rolled out? 
Well, so one thing we did, for example, in Q4 was site links. So on the search results, if you, um, we've, we introduced a while ago that there are a number of different links underneath a search result. Mm -hmm. And what we enabled advertisers to do is to list 10 different alternate links and then for us to choose and optimize among them. So these are the links that are surfaced inside of a site when it's pretty clear that you're doing a navigational search or where you're, you're coming to, you know, you do CNN and then there's... So within the ad, so for example, if it's um, like Toys R Us, within the Toys R Us ad it would say, you know, buy Nerf footballs, Barbie special, right. and you know, a whole right. bunch of different things. Things they might want to promote uh, that are sort of subcategories under Toys right. R Us. So that was something we rolled out. We actually, as a product, we built it really, really fast. We built it, I think, in like six weeks or you know, five weeks. We built in a short period of time. We went to the sales team for Q4, and it was you know, rolled out in Q4 to a lot of advertisers globally. Right. Right. I would say uh, another example is YouTube, right? So we're experimenting yeah. with uh, in-stream video, in-stream video ads. Uh, a lot of the iteration between the product team and the sales team is based on, you know, what are advertisers saying? Is it is it achieving their their objectives? And a lot of times, you know, we're bringing the product team into those sales discussions so they can hear the feedback directly from yeah. from the advertisers. One of the things that you, so you bring up YouTube, and YouTube is, I think, a, was was something of a turning point for, for Google. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it was yeah. a, it's a very important acquisition. It was a mm -hmm huge asset in terms of both just media content, but also uh, one of the largest search query volume engines yeah. mm -hmm. on the planet. And I don't think people really realize that YouTube alone is, is, is had more search queries than, than Yahoo. Um, uh, and, uh, but it also brought along an expectation from the point of view of, of marketers that they were going to be able to do not so much direct marketing, which I think, you know, Google was sort of considered in that bucket or a, you know, a very close cousin to that bucket, mm -hmm. but brand marketing. Yeah. Um, and this was something that I think it's fair to say wasn't a particularly strong muscle at Google, um, how to service uh, brand marketers. Um, how's that going? So, I, you know, I would say what the YouTube acquisition did, if you think about Google and search, it's a very left brain logical activity. And the discussions that we would have with marketers and with agencies were very left brain logical ROI, very clear ROI driven. Um, I think YouTube has kind of given us that right brain, right? So the, the conversations are much more creative. The things that we can do are uh, much more, I, I think, in keeping with what the creative community wants to do now with the internet and how they want to engage with their audience. So things like, you know, we have this campaign running in Brazil called Pal Palpita Brazil which is a uh, combination of uh, kind of Volkswagen, uh, Sony, Vivo getting together and saying, hey, you know, Brazilians are just absolutely passionate about the World Cup. How do we capture some of that? How do we engage with that audience and get, uh, get real feedback from the audience as to, as to how they're thinking about kind of the progression of the, of the games? So, you know, that's something we clearly couldn't have done with just search, and now you have thousands of Brazilians uploading their singing the national anthem and talking about the games uh, in an environment that's really exciting for, for the sponsors. So that's sort of a custom integrated brand it's engagement. It's much more like, a, yes, what you would typically call uh, But that isn't content. necessarily a product that scales or that is sort of driven by an algorithmic underpinning, is it? Well, there are programs that you can build off of that that will scale, and uh -huh. that's what we try to do, is we'll do a big sort of prototype uh -huh. And then we'll we'll learn from that. We'll work with the product team and then you'll and figure productize out how we build it and that into it. a platform. Right. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Um, it's been. I'll just say, you know, the double click acquisition too was also brought a huge amount of display expertise into the company. And the thing, like tying that back to YouTube, the thing that's been really useful is YouTube is our publisher running on the double click system. So everything that they have. You know, feedback on on the double click system, like we hear directly from mm -hmm. our own internal salespeople, like right. why can't the double click system, or can you guys make it do this? And that's been really useful for us too to have our own internal customer, our own internal publisher right. using our systems. Right. Now, display, you know, it's been stated by, but every, everybody at Google is sort of display is what they talk about, and it's been the last six months mm -hmm. to a year. I think late last year, Eric. Schmidt said, you know, display is our next multi-billion dollar market opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, we had Hillary from Yahoo here yesterday, um, and uh, she's, she's like, hey, wait a minute, not so fast. Um, 
uh, Yahoo's uh, sort of king of display, or queen, as I, she said yesterday. Um, <clears throat> differentiate your display offerings from others in the market. W what is it that you do that you think is unique? Do you have so I would say first, uh, just the massive reach that yeah. you have, uh, world's largest network, uh, for sure. The granularity of targeting that you can do with our system is better than anything out there, and uh, and more transparent. Um, and you're starting to get some of the, I think you're starting to see some of the promise of what you can do with data with things like remarketing in a very intelligent way. So those are the three things that seem to resonate with advertisers and with agencies. A couple other things I'd add to that. We've been really excited about our exchange, which is mm -hmm. um, you know, offered real-time bidding. And the ability to really um, open up as much as possible our network and let anyone start bidding and do that in a real-time basis has been something that we think is you know, really differentiated. And then we've also had um, self-service display advertising, which I think has been super cool. Um, so we have Display Ad Builder, where anyone can come in and go click, 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 and have their display campaign up and running in almost no time at all. Have you found people find that product as valuable as, well, maybe I'll just go back to the, to the AdSense, or the, you know, to the AdWords of the AdSense, because that, I, I can measure the return on, you know, on my investment. Well, it, it is part of AdWords and AdSense. Right, so, so you can sort of A-B it, right? Yes. So you, so you can certainly do a comparison, you get stats on it. But um, I think a lot of advertisers who were just doing text, who had never done display before, see the value of doing that. And so a lot of it is bringing new display advertisers mm -hmm. to the market. And um, I actually think the more that we can do that, the more you can make the display advertising be targeted and relevant and useful um, and cool, because you just have more advertisers to choose from. Do you from. ever see a time when display pushes its shoulders its way into the results on Google.com? So the interesting thing I see is that, so a big initiative we have on search are new display formats, new ad formats. Um, so for example, with product ads right now, we have the ability to show pictures of the products and the prices. And so um, search is becoming a lot like display in some ways, because we're expanding to these new ad formats, but. And it, it, in other words, I think what you're going is like, if you look at what's happening in the organic results, mm -hmm. it's not just blue links anymore. It, there's a lot, there's, there's images, there's. And, it, that's, it, and that's true also for the ads. So just like the search results are becoming multi-format, like you can see videos and you know, maps and like sports scores and like really anything, like we want the ads to be able to do that too. Just no punch the so monkey. So we're showing videos. <laughs> like I know, so we're sh there, <laughs> there's not gonna be punch the monkey, no. Um, unless there's a movie and that would be the movie trailer. But, um, <laughs> Got it. But uh, yeah, so I mean I see a lot of the display formats uh, and being customized and moving over to search and then search in a lot of ways is, be display in a lot of ways is picking up some of the right. um, characteristics of search. You, you mentioned ad exchanges, so I, I want to ask you about the, uh, the invite sure. acquisition. Why did you buy a DSP? Um, why did we die, buy a DSP? Well, first of all, we're investing really heavily in display advertising, and we're investing very heavily in our exchange. And the ability for advertisers to, do, you know, to buy across exchanges, to be able to do much more um, um, data-driven, um, data-driven ways of actually purchasing, but also just to enable and open up and make as easy as possible the ability for people to buy advertising in however they want to buy it. Mm -hmm. So, and we also heard, you know, we're working very closely with a lot of the agencies, and we've heard from agencies um, really the demand and interest in working with, uh, um, like having us be a bidder in, and um, acquire How, how does DSP. that work in terms of the DSP being sort of a front end, as I understand it, to a, an entire ecosystem of potential inventory, including inventory that is not necessarily, you know, Google inventory, right? Yeah. And, but DoubleClick has the exchange, right, already. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that going to continue and flourish, or is it going to shift in terms of what, what's at the back end of the exchange and the DSP? Um, well, so we just acquired them, so we'll have to figure that out over time. You um, must have known when you acquired them. <laughs> well, so I mean, just like DFA works across all platforms, right. and just like our exchange works across all platforms, so, right. which I think is pretty incredible that, you know, when you think about it, that we've opened up the ability for AdSense to be, um, you know, purchased across all networks. So we've right. really been moving to being as open as possible. And right. so I think 
you know, having a bidder in that sense is exactly the same. The ability to buy across all different types of networks is very similar to that trend. Right. Um, I want to make sure that there's time for questions because I tend to just not allow. So please come, come up, bring the mics up, and, and I want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask these folks uh, any questions that you might have. And while we're waiting for whatever the first question might be for Susan and Dennis, I wanted to ask, how, how has the culture changed at Google in the last you know, five or so years? Uh, when I was sort of deep in it and working on the book, it was very clear that there was sort of almost a caste system. You know, the engineers sort of ran the company, and the sales folks, who were relatively new to the culture, um, were not seen as, as necessarily the leaders of the company. Well, I, I think you know, Google, uh, Google is run by engineers. If you look at the management team, I think 13 of the 15 people on our operating committee are engineers. And uh, there's no doubt that the value in, in our business is created by the code. Right? At the same time, as the business has gotten more complex and as uh, our relationship with partners has gotten deeper, where we're, we're uh, licensing or acquiring content for some of our products, uh, we're increasingly you know, we're sharing ad revenue to the tune of billions of dollars with partners. Uh, you know, clearly, the sales team and, and the relationship with product has, got, has gotten uh, deeper. So I think, I think it's a fairly equal partnership. But you know, there's no doubt that you're talking about where is the company going, how do we make decisions. You want people who understand the technology to make those decisions. And I think that's how uh, Eric and the founders run the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the culture is, um, I mean, I think the, culture, the thing about the culture and the thing about our industry is just how quickly everything is changing. So I've all, actually, you mentioned some of the, the chaos. I've actually always seen that as a core advantage. Like the more, you know, the ability to say, look, you know, this has changed. I mean, who would have anticipated how much change was seen in mobile or how much change we'd be seeing in, you know, the display industry? Um, and so the ability to really move quickly and to be able to make those decisions fast has been, I think, a really core asset for us. Um, speaking of changing kind of, you know, changing competitive landscape, um, one of the interesting shifts in the last few years has been if you look at the referral traffic to any particular uh, site or service or platform on the web, a very significant growing percentage of that referral and growing much more quickly than search um, has been Facebook and Twitter. Um, how do you respond to that? How do you, uh, you know, respond to what could be considered a threat to Google's dominance of sort of the attention uh, graph of, of the internet? Yeah. Where Google was sort of the oxygen in the ecosystem um, sort of spreading attention around, and now it, it seems quite clear that Twitter and Facebook uh, are, are really significant players in spreading that attention around and could be seen as competitors both in search and, and, and in, 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 in marketing around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think they also can be seen, like Twitter, you know, um, we have a partnership with, with uh, Twitter to offer real-time search off of Google. But I think there's no question, you know, the web has become very social, and that's a trend that we recognize, and that I think is a trend, you know, that offers all kinds of opportunities for new products and new changes and new ways of finding information. And we're a company about finding information at the end of the day. And so I think it, pre it presents opportunities and challenges for us to continue to innovate in and to partner with, um, to partner with some of the leaders in that space, too. Yeah. You, so, you, for example, you've got Twitter feeds in, in your in AdSense units now, right? Yeah. So we just introduced Twitter feeds in AdSense, which yeah. I think is pretty cool, so that the content can be the actual feeds themselves. Right. right. Yep. That's that is cool. Do we have questions? We have questions over here. Where are we? Hello. Ah. Hello, Brian Lenhart from American Express Open. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about someone's current location as a data point and then integrating that into your products and services. I, I mean, I, I think from an advertising standpoint, you know, the, the opportunities are, are pretty obvious. I, we're, we're seeing a lot of traction with, uh, with search in particular and search advertising um, because pe people are out and about and they're searching and we have yet another signal that we can use to tune and target advertising, and we're seeing that pay off for both our advertisers and, and for Google. Yeah. 
And, and one other thing I would add is I think mobile will offer really exciting opportunities to do a lot of different kinds of local advertising. And um, I think we're really just getting started there. And how do you actually target based on you know, the location from your mobile phone? And how do, you, you know, how do advertisers customize their messages based on where they're located or if they want to bid differently based on where they're located? So those are all things that we're actually we're thinking about. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll be doing more in that area. One thing that's really interesting is retail. Because if you think about a uh, uh, shopping experience, you might you may have uh, in the past bought something from a Walmart or a Target. And, um, and if you are driving by, um, you know, and, we, and we know that, and you've allowed us to know that, then obviously we could target advertising as well as natural results differently uh, because we know where you are and we know a little bit about, uh, about your preference. So those are the kinds of things we're experimenting with. And uh, retailers are very excited about those sorts of opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, real-time price is, a, is going to be a, a way that we, we shop. In a Particularly your, your long tail sort of self-service, the small businesses, which really the first yeah. 100 or 200,000 of your advertisers were those folks. And what's interesting with mobile is that we're finding the small advertiser again in many ways is leading. So there's a, a company where we work with called Saveology, which you probably haven't heard of, but they are a uh, price comparison site for mobile and uh, cable. And they find that click to call really works well because if they can get a customer on the line with a sales rep, they have a much higher chance yeah. of closing them than if they make them fill out a very complex form on the web. Um, so they're saying, hey, you know, that's where we that's the future for us. Right. Getting filling up our call center is a new value proposition really that mobile has. Um, and we're still in the very early days. Interesting. You have other questions out here? I wanted to ask you while we're waiting um, about your relationship to agencies. Um, I think it's fair to say 05, 06, maybe 07, um, there were heads of holding companies calling Google the frenemy. Um, has that changed, <laughs> do you think? So I think it has changed pretty significantly. I mean, we have uh, strong relationships with all of the big six and, and the large independents. Um, in the last year in the Americas, we've uh, nearly tripled our team that's focused on the agency community. We brought in Torrance Boone, who used to head up uh, a WPP agency to run that in the US. And uh, we're increasingly working with the creative community, uh, both on commercial projects and pro bono projects, to push the edge of the envelope around YouTube. Um, and I think that uh, you know, as we've scaled our business, our value proposition to the agency community has become clearer. You know, clearly there are business challenges for any large integrated agency moving from what historically has been a TV and print dominated business into a digital one. Um, you know, I, I think it's our, our goal to help solve that problem. Let me ask you one last question because we're almost out of time. Um, last week at the D conference, um, Steve Ballmer called Google the behemoth, <laughs> um, which I thought was kind of interesting coming from Microsoft. Um, but, and by the way, he acknowledged that might be sort of interesting coming from Microsoft. <laughs> but, at, but in search, he was specifically referring to search and to his search share of 11 or 12 percent and, and Google's in the United States in, in the mid-60s to 70s, depending on who's measuring. Um, what do you make of Bing? And, and are you hearing about it in the marketplace? And do you hear about it in product meetings? And do you guys say, oh, those guys have figured something out that we wish we could do? I mean, you just gave us the ability to put cool pictures on our homepage like Bing has. Is, is Bing a, a welcome, competitive, uh, you know, does, is it in your head? Is Steve Ballmer in your head? I, so, yeah. No. So I, I think he's not literally in <laughs> well, my head. You just head. said yes and no. <laughs> but we do Which think, do we, we tweet? Do, <laughs> but we do think about, we do think about Bing. And um, I mean, I think any company needs to take competition seriously and take them as a competitor seriously. And, you know, our view has always been competition is really good because it drives the innovation in the marketplace. And they're going to come up with some sets of things. And the more that both of us can be innovating in the space, the better it is ultimately for the consumers. But um, I mean, I, I think there's no question that you know, it's definitely something that we are watching closely and continuing to innovate yeah. in. I think that the, the, if you think about Google, Google was built on the, there's a lot of things that are going on that are changing the competitive landscape. Uh, Google was built on the wired web and we're all moving to wireless. So right. if Google doesn't get that transition right, that can be an issue. Yeah. 
Uh, if you look outside the U.S., there are strong competitors in a lot of markets that have very interesting technology and interesting applications like Yandex in Russia, uh, Seznam in the Czech Republic, or, or Baidu in China. Um, and, uh, and you, you know, you talk about Twitter, you talk about Facebook, they all have very interesting search applications. So um, you can even talk about commerce. Amazon is a search engine of a sort for someone yep, who's shopping. Absolutely. So the, the, the market is quite interesting, and there's not, there's not one specific... Uh, general application of search that necessarily is going to uh, dominate over the next decade. Right. Right? All of these things are in play right now, which is, I think, what makes it pretty exciting for us. Absolutely. Well, I wish we had more time, but we don't. So please join me in thanking Susan and Dennis for coming and speaking with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thanks a lot.